Okay. Hi. We have a small crowd right now. Hopefully we'll get a few more people, but for the time being, thank you all for turning up, and hopefully we'll get a few more folks. But if not, guess what? You get a night of really, really cool, personalized entertainment. Well, personalized in the sense that we're here, we'll be looking at you, but we're pretty much going to talk about the same shit that we're going to be talking about anyway. So, um, And we appreciate it. Thank you very much. You would have said get intimate with the samurai, but some of us take that word a little different. Yeah, and... Uh, and, and Mikey, I was talking to the people at the Repro Clinic, and they were talking about the number of times that you stopped by to give samples and, um, and where you do it, too. Um, look, they, they have a room for that sort of thing, so doing it in the actual like waiting area is not cool. Doing it on top of the... Yeah. They said, hey, I did it outside because one of the hands were two of the bush, and I thought I would double my... Yeah, there you go. Okay, I can see that logic, actually. I was gonna, the, the words restraining order came up, but I'm working for you, man. I'm just saying. Okay, so among other things, first of all, uh, we all survived a trip to Missouri this weekend. Uh, and you will be hearing more about this later, I'm sure, because <laughs> it turned out to be quite eventful. Um, there is a black box over there, the black box, if you happen to have a couple of spare dollars after you buy some food, drink, tip some people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a black box. It's a black box. Um, is for donations. Uh, that's for, I believe we're doing Planned Parenthood this week. So if you're in favor of them, please feel free to drop some money in there. I'm, yeah. <laughs> we have an audience of, <laughs> we have an audience of four. Let's hold on to them. Wait, you're a performer. Get your ass back in. <laughs> Here, you can't leave, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm sorry, we should have pointed out that you pretty much have to put up with the, uh, the, gr the group decisions on this. But now that you're part of the group, you actually get a say. Yeah, you know, because we're we're doing our level best to kind of keep the world from having more and more people like, yeah, and uh, we just kind of handle it that way. I was trying to think of what else. Oh, we have a couple of things coming up this month. If you happen to have some spare time next Thursday, which will be the 23rd, um, we're going to be appearing at the Slowdown again. Apparently, they like us and they're having us back. And then the Monday after, which is the 27th, we're having what we're referring to as the uh, Samurai Spotlight Show. And what it is is that two of the usual samurai performers we're going to be doing this monthly are going to be taking longer sets. So it's going to be about an hour and a half long show. And the first one is going to be me and a family. And then the second one is going to be Mikey and Christopher Wig. So um, if you like the material, come on down, enjoy. Um, if you don't like the material, well, we're sorry, kind of. Okay, we're, we're only regretful in the fact that you don't like it, but we're going to do it anyway. And so, to begin, um, we have a great and wonderful moment here. Um, Ellen Wig has been uh, one of those great performers that we have who sometimes has keep even... Me last I keep doing that and I apologize, but it's Wig, Wigs, I, I am so horribly sorry. One eye. One, okay, there we go. So anyway, Ellen, no last name, uh, has scheduling issues that sometimes make mine seem relatively minor. And this is the first time we've actually had him here early enough where he can open a show. So I figured it was as good an opportunity as any. Of course, I decided to tell him this two minutes after he walked in the door 20 minutes ago. <laughs> and so, ladies and gentlemen, Alan. He does this because he knows that I write all of my pieces during the previous performer's acts. <laughs> so now I have to break the habit next time. Um, <laughs> so uh, last week, uh, David Rakoff died. For, for those of you who don't know who that is, he was an essayist, he was an actor. He contributed a lot to This American Life. Um, and after he passed Fresh Air, re ran an interview with him about the book he published a couple of years ago. So yeah, this is a public radio oriented piece, so put your sad hat on. Um, but one of the essays in, uh, his, in his last book touches on a topic that's been on my mind a lot recently, and I wanted to read a little bit of it. Um, for context, this is when uh, he was in process of ending his sessions with a therapist, um, because the therapist was dying, but that's not important here. Um, and he's reacting to the fact that the therapist seems to have taken a liking to him over the time that they've worked together um, and says that he's going to miss him more than his other patients, that he wishes he could still see him around. Um, and uh, this, is, this is his reaction in part to that. And for the benefit of listeners who can't see what I'm reading, uh, it is all in parentheses and one long run-on sentence. <clears throat> Sigh. 
Should you happen to be possessed of a certain verbal acuity coupled with a relentless hair trigger humor and surface cheer, spackled over a chronic melancholy and, uh, and loneliness, a grotesquely charactered version of your deepest self which you trot out at the slightest provocation for endearing and glib comic effect, thus rendering you the kind of fellow who is beloved by all yet loved by none, all of it to distract, however fleetingly, from the cold and dead-faced truth that with each passing year you face uh, the unavoidable certainty of a solitary future in which you will perish one day while vainly attempting the Heimlich maneuver on yourself over the back of a kitchen chair. <laughs> then this confirmation that you have triumphed again and managed to gull yet another mark, except this time it was the one person you'd hoped might be immune to your ever creakier, puddle shallow, sideshow barker variation on adorable, even though you'd been launching this campaign weekly with single minded concentration from day one. Well, it conjures up feelings that are best described as mixed, to say the least. Now, the thing that I love about that bit is uh, not just the wit and humor that's in, uh, that's in it, and not just its uh, fantastically bleak uh, depiction of its subject, but the perspective that it comes from. Because you can't write something like that if you don't believe it. You also can't write something about that unless you also know that it is a complete load of bullshit. And this is what they call in the psychological profession cognitive dissonance. The idea that you can completely have an opinion, hold that opinion at the depth of your soul, and at the same time know that it is wrong, that it is factually incorrect. Um, and this is something that I think is pretty deep in the psyches of a lot of people in our country, and something that I've had a struggle with for a lot of years. Now, like Mr. Rakoff, I've uh, suffered from depression for many years. This is where I'm supposed to say that the rest of the years I quite enjoyed it, but that's bullshit. Who enjoys depression? Um, Pfizer. <laughs> 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 Profit is the enjoyment that corporate persons have. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people feel like being depressed is like the opposite of being an egomaniac. If you're full of yourself and you uh, feel like you walk on water and uh, your shit is made of daisies, then you know that's basically the absolute opposite of being depressed, right? If you're depressed, you think you're nothing. You think that uh, you don't think about yourself at all. This could not be further from the truth. Depression is the most insidious and terrifying form of egotism. When you're depressed, when you're, when you're really at the bottom of a hole, you can't think of anyone else but yourself. You can't think of anything other than the fact that everyone around you is having a better time and doing a better job with their life. And this means that you must think you're pretty fucking special. That level of cognitive dissonance has to come from a pretty deep-seated point. Uh, where it's not just a mood disorder, it's not just a feeling of a chemical imbalance in your brain, it's actually a delusion. It's, a, it's being able to look at the world, see what's happening around you, see what's happening in your life, and believe the opposite. Uh, now, when I, was, when I was a kid, I was, I was raised Catholic, I went to, I went to catechism, and uh, they taught us about the seven deadly sins. Now, in later years, in, in you know, when I was a kid, more than people, some other people who might be in this room tonight. Catholicism has moved away a bit from the lists of things you shouldn't do, because uh, they realized at a certain point that you could uh, cross out thou shalt not and put a little checkbox there, and uh, it becomes a nice little facility for uh, delinquency. But we did learn about the seven deadly sins when I was a kid. and. Uh, the funny thing about the seven deadly sins is that six of them have a negative connotation in our society. Um, you, don't, uh, you don't talk about your wrath as necessarily being a good thing. Even if you're lusting after someone, you feel maybe a little bit guilty about that. Or if you don't, you know you should. But uh, pride. Pride is something that is lauded and encouraged, at least in America. Um, if you don't have pride for your city or your state or your ethnic group, then there's something seen to be wrong with you. And yet, this is right down there on the list with the other six things that will get you to into hell. Uh, and when I was a child, I saw something of a disconnect there, being a rules-oriented kid. 
So I looked at the opposites, the, the heavenly virtues that are supposed to counteract the deadly sins, and I figured, well, if this is one that everybody else isn't paying attention to, I better do extra to make up. That was the sort of child I was. It was not very fun. Um, <laughs> So humility became my watchword. No matter what happened, no matter how uh, proud I was of myself outwardly, I would always be humble. I would not take any extra credit. I would not uh, tell people how excellent of a person I was. Now, for someone with a fantastically supportive family who gets straight A's in school, this is kind of a recipe for disaster. So as I grew up, with humility firmly in my mind, I became the kid that uh, would take the accolades, would hear the people telling me that I deserved praise and fortune in all of my future endeavors, and it would go pretty much one of two ways. One, I was pretty sure they were bullshitting me, or two, uh, I, <clears throat> uh, I figured that they were simply mistaken. Somehow, all of the positive qualities that, uh, that all these people were imbuing me with existed only in their mind because I was the one who knew me best and I had to stay humble, which means that there's no way that I could believe all of the great things that were being said about me. Whether or not some of them were made up by my parents or not, we'll leave to uh, hit the scholars. Um, so these habits are formed early and they stick with you for a lot of your life. Uh, this was, became built into my view of the world. Now, being an introspective person, as I went through uh, puberty, as I started to fall away from the church, I started realizing that my, my worldview was a little bit messed up in this regard. Introspection showed me that I was building a counterfactual reality. I was, I was telling myself lies simply so that I wouldn't have to feel proud. And uh, I was protecting the world from what I saw as my ego. Instead of taking all of the uh, praise and, building, uh, and blowing up my head, I was uh, building a negative ego. Every day that, uh, that something good would happen to me, I would say I didn't deserve it. And uh, rather than you know, do the same thing and think, oh, hey, maybe I, should, uh, my, maybe I should rethink what I've been taught all my life, or maybe I'm taking it the wrong way and I should interpret it differently, I figured, well, shit, if I have to protect the world from my ego, I must have a terrible one. I must have to protect the world from my ego every day, or else I would rub and roughshod over everyone around me. It's that egotism thing again. Apparently, I, uh, I have such a, a power for destruction in my soul and in my, uh, in my behaviors that the only thing that can keep me from hurting everyone around me is massive crushing depression. Uh, and as part of this, because I, I never wanted to impose my will on the world around me, I became a big believer in live and let live. I uh, didn't... <clears throat> I, I, I didn't want to impose my opinion on anyone else because who am I to, uh, to say that, uh, that I know what uh, you should be doing better than you do? Even as my own opinions about uh, morality changed and politics, I figured, well, there's people who are more, bigger experts than I am. However, live and let live is not exactly the way the world is being run these days. Eventually, I got to the point that I started looking around me and looking at all of these people that I was protecting from me, and uh, I realized that uh, about 50% of them don't believe in the theory of evolution. Um, these are people who will jump at the chance to have a diet where they can eat steaks all day and apparently not gain weight, but when people start talking about global warming, they're like, well, let's wait for the science. We're in the middle of a pitched election in which one side says that they would really like everyone to give up their uh, health care at the end of their lives so that we don't have to raise the taxes on millionaires by about 5%. I looked around and I realized that uh, I actually do know a hell of a lot better than most of these people and that's not necessarily ego talking. At a certain point, perspective can become a trap. It can become an excuse to disconnect from the rest of the world, to say, 
I need to make sure that what I'm doing is the right thing, and the best way to do that is to do nothing that affects anyone around me. But uh, nobody's being protected from the egos that I see out there. Nobody is being protected from the egos of Rush Limbaugh or Mitt Romney. And uh, if the sort of behavior that I have, this cognitive dissonance that made me for so long think that I couldn't dis dictate the opinions of other people is the same thing that is making these people feel like they can have their opinions dictated to them by the popular culture and the mass media, uh, I think I'm gonna uh, start to go out and do a little protecting from somebody else. And that's all I got for tonight, folks. <clears throat> it's always kind of interesting because I find myself um, in the middle of the show writing and rewriting my set, and I have a sneaking suspicion that it, it happens every show that uh, themes emerge. And I tend to hear other people talking, so you may see some of this information again. <clears throat> Just saying. Anyway. We have a new samurai. I believe it's that gentleman right there. Uh, we're going to give him the top knot. And oh, I'm sorry, it's that bastard sitting right there in the ball cap. <laughs> there we go. Well done. Welcome to the team. And so we are going to throw him up on stage for his first ever performance as an actual member of the team. Welcome to the stage, Rocco Caniglia. Give it up for Alan one more time, please. If Sasquatch was a motivational speaker, God damn it, that's what it would look like. <laughs> now, uh, I gotta tell you, I fucking hate technology. Do any uh, techno geeks out there tonight? Oh, obviously. Yeah, fuck you. Fuck you, fuck your computer, fuck your mouse, fuck everything. Fuck, I hate technology with a fucking passion. You wanna know why I hate technology? Because tonight, I've been moving all weekend. All right, so I didn't really have time to prepare for this show tonight, so I kind of rushed and I got on my mom's computer. Now, not only does this computer not recognize any goddamn writing file that I've sent to it in the last three fucking years because for some reason, Microsoft has to keep updating and updating and updating and updating. You gotta fucking find the next goddamn update before you can actually get your writing onto a different computer. But uh, basically what happened was I tried to print out a bunch of different poetry. Well, the printer ran out of ink. And instead of doing what a normal person would do and just hit cancel printing, the papers just kept going and going and going. So I decided to shove more paper in there. <laughs> and you know what happened after that? It started shooting out two sheets and then three sheets and then six sheets until the printer acted like a pompous asshole and was just like, you know, I'm not working anymore. Fuck you, I'm turning the power off, click. And then the printer doesn't work. So then I decided, well, you know what? Screw it. I'll just go get my laptop. My trusty laptop, right? <laughs> nope. <laughs> apparently, I spent too much time charging the battery because apparently you can overcharge a battery on a laptop. Who knew that? Who knew you could give something too much power? And yeah, that fucking thing wouldn't turn on worth a shit. <laughs> so basically, what I did was I did something that hasn't been done in probably, I don't know, five, 10 years. I hand wrote my script, my fucking set. <laughs> I wrote it out in cursive. Ha <laughs> ha, fuck you. <laughs> and I just, I got to thinking about it. And I was like, wait a second. So why, okay, everyone in here who's ever had a computer has had a crash on you, yeah? Everyone's had a crash on you. Okay, so how fucking annoying is it when a computer crashes on you? Now, I want to know who was the genius that decided that here's this machine that's really prone to, to crash and fuck everything up. Let's run the whole world on the shittiest shit ever. That's like me being a chef and being like, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to serve canner grade beef just because... It's the most horrible thing and obvious, and you know what? People are gonna eat it, so fuck you. So with that being said, 
My first poem is kind of about that. Actually, I wrote it when the 49er was closing. And moment of silence for the 49er. God knows we all got really drunk, got laid, did a lot of drugs in that fucking place. So this one is, what's that? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's probably next. Shit. Um, anyways, this one's called Progress, parenthesized, the old only looks forward to dying. The world is slowly killing the old, trading in class and style for progress. Elderly buildings are locked away and abandoned or euthanized. Their bricks broken down to the molecule to create plastic, gaudy, gutless testaments to the here and now. They won't last a century. Their souls are buried in parking lots. The analog embodiment of music is now replaced by digital data, hollow and cold in its precision, leaving no room for the warmth of human error. The dying art of taking pad to pen is about to be replaced by the droning rhythm of typing. Cars are now more computer than man-made machinery out of Detroit. Even fire has been replaced by magnetism. Talking is texting. We're two steps away from our floating recliners. Is this progress or suicide? Class and style and hard work haven't died. They're just waiting for a disaster to come save us from progress. Thank you. The next two are kind of on the, the same line. Um, I've kind of gone through a, a change in my life where I'm going to bars less and drinking less because the more and more I look around bars, the more and more I see the people that I don't want to become. I mean, uh, well, this, the more and more I look around bars, I saw the people that I once was, the people or the person that I once was embodied in a bunch of different kids running around and uh, acting like jackasses. And I also see the old men at the bars. And these poor bastards have been going to bars for years and years, and you know, they're, they're gonna die in a bar one day, you know that. I mean, their last words are gonna be, uh, shot at Jack. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so basically, uh, the first one I'm gonna do is called Growing Old in a Bar. Aptly. Shaking away the good times, looking for the little victories, trying to find an alignment in the planets and stars to get my lucky day. Praying for Peter Pan to whisk away an old man to Neverland. Wax poetic and gaze wistfully at these children turning into memories, wishing for one more chance to make it all right. But wishing on stars, is for kids, for hope, for the future that doesn't exist. A reflection and a spirit far past the throat and the guts about to be pissed away. Growing old in a bar, shaking away the better days, hoping to get another drink before I get the shakes. Thank you. Actually, I did this poem the first time I came up here and performed uh, that ass backwards audition deal that I did. Uh, everyone knows this guy. We, anyone who's going, gone to a bar knows that prick that just won't shut the fuck up. You know, he sits next to you, keeps on talking and talking and talking about how he's so great at this, that, and the other, and then he asks you to buy him a shot. You know, you know that guy? Well, okay, he's me, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> This one's called Lamenting Also Ran. <clears throat> Have a seat. I can't buy you a drink, but I can give you some good company, or at least allow you to buy me one. I've got stories for days about how I got high with 311 and Jerry Garcia. I slept with Christy Brinkley while valeting at a hotel once, and Billy Joel was in Philly at the time. Hell, boy. I recorded the Wilhelm scream. <laughs> what am I doing now? Son, I'm a janitor at a local high school. 
trying to scout my next divorce. See, that's the key to life, man. You got to look at everything at least 12 steps ahead. I remember this time in Mexico, Tijuana, if memory serves. Me and my good buddy Michael Douglas went halves on a tranny that was hotter than that afternoon. You know, I met George Bush in an airport once. Senior, not junior. I told him we need to protect the gas. So how about that shot? You seem like a real good guy. You remind me of a young John Holmes, all young, dumb, and full of cum. So what the hell am I doing here in this dive, you ask? I'm just passing time, drinking away the bad times. What? Do I have any kids? Yeah, man, two girls and a boy. They don't talk to me anymore. What the hell do you mean, a waste? I have a great collection of good times and scars and beaten diseases and broken dreams. But when you have those close to you set the bar low for you, then they won't ever be disappointed. Thanks for the shot, man, and the company. I just hope I helped you. Thanks. All right, so this is going to be my last one. and. Uh, I kind of got my start doing this up at uh, the spot called uh, Shoot Your Mouth Off, and it used to be down at Straight Shooters, uh, Straight Shooters 2, down on 40th and Farnham, and then it moved up to the hideout, and yeah, it got really crazy after that. But one thing that I kind of got known for in that little circuit was uh, improvising poetry. So I would like, uh, I'd like some people to shout out three words, and I'll throw them into a poem for you. So uh, anyone? Joint? Oh, come on. Give me something good. Horticulture. Horticulture? All right. Beta Galactosides. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay, words you can pronounce. Okay. Yeah, no shit. I don't speak French, and I don't know what the fuck that means. <laughs> Rendezvous. Rendezvous. All right, that's a good one. Uh, what's that? Motherfucker. Mother okay, we'll, we'll throw a dumb one in there. Motherfucker. All right. <laughs> you dye your beard red. We established that already. <laughs> okay, so we got rendezvous, motherfucker, and horticulture, right? Okay. I try to find, I try to find the cut down trees, trying to give me oxygen, but I find myself in the breeze left of the west wind because it lets me go again but I can't break it down anymore because it's not that. It's the horticulturalist that tries to grow me. It's the inspiration that tries to find everything that I say out of my mind, but it breaks it down one last. Every second of every day, I try to look back and I try to pray, but it seems like my prayers are in silence because foolishness Foolishness, man, now that's a rendezvous with time. But I'm just some dumb motherfucker with another line to say up here on a stage, trying to whisk away, trying to wait, trying to listen, trying to look, trying to find words and bricks and mortar, trying to find intelligence in some kid with Down syndrome. I just keep on digging like a dog but I feel myself becoming a rain dog because I can't find my way home. That's my time. Thank you. I'm Rocco Coniglia. It's going to be an interesting evening for some of us up here performing tonight. Um, for you know the usual number of reasons uh you know whether we've been drinking not drinking did something before the show didn't do something before the show um but we had that classic moment where mikey was like yeah i'll do the show but i really don't have anything prepared so i'm going to kind of like freestyle it and i'm really really looking forward to this and then it dawned on me a bit a little bit later on i'm pretty much going to be doing the same thing so you're going to get the 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 bald big guy freestyling show uh tonight and so that should be fairly interesting hopefully i'll come up with something really good i don't even have to worry about the next guy because it's mikey and it's always good so please come up and join us
supposed to be on the X, right? That's yes. Yeah. yeah, that was put there for me. And Rock, Rocky, you need to check that out, too, that, that X right there. Oh, shit. <laughs> it's like a magic show. You can one place in 10 minutes. I'm gonna give That's true. Rest. That's true. But you don't forget to give the internet some head. Oh, yeah. You gotta get right up close to it. Yeah. Okay. I'm scared of things like that near my face. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, yeah, like, like Dave said, I... Uh, you know, I, I didn't prepare much for this show, and and Rocky kind of said the same thing, but he said he was moving all weekend. I was drinking all weekend, so I didn't. <laughs> so I figured I'd get some topics, something would pop into my head, and it did, and I had a little thing worked out, but then I got some news about an hour ago that, uh, uh, not, a, not a friend, he, he was a guy that I did some things with, I worked with, uh, part of the Z92 family back when I was a running character on Todd and Tyler, uh, Jay Medicine had passed away this afternoon, so I hate to be the one to break it to you. Uh, that guy, you know, no matter how much stupid shit he made me do under hypnosis, no matter how much, you know, when you're a running character on that show, he uh, he would fuck with you if you went to the show. But if you were in studio and you tried, I mean, you tried your ass off to get up in the studio when he was there, he would fucking torture you. And it didn't stop when the commercial started. It got worse. So. Uh, you know, a lot of you guys know who he was. You may have seen his shows, heard him on Todd and Tyler. Uh, you know, it, it kind of uh, kind of floored me when I saw it, and I thought, you know what? I'm really fucking bummed out. I'm not going to do the show. Then I said, no, the one place I need to be is on stage and talk about uh, Jay a little bit. I don't, you know, I have a lot of stories about him. I'm not going to get into that right now. You know, some of them, I don't think the statute of limitations have let go yet. <laughs> But uh, I figured the easiest thing for me to do is, you know, just uh, give a shout out to him. And since I didn't bring any hookers or cocaine on stage with me, I'd like to do a shot of whiskey for Jay Medicine Hat. And rest in peace, brother. So sorry if I bummed anybody out, but you know it happens. So the one thing I didn't want to talk about. And it kind of makes sense and it kind of flows into it. Because the one thing you think about when somebody just out of the blue passes away it, are the things that you have that you're, you know, make take for granted or that you're, you're glad for. And that's my family. And I don't talk about my family a lot. I mean, I've heard Dave talk about his grandfather, the way he influenced him. And uh, Chris Wigg uh, talks about his, his relationship with his brother. And the one reason I don't talk a lot about my family is because my dad said if I, you know, when I started doing this and you know, I started doing my podcast years ago, if I tell any really embarrassing stories about him or my mother, he will fucking kill me, and I believe him. <laughs> so I don't tell a lot of stories about them. I talk about growing up, but I don't you know, really say a lot about them. Uh, I guess uh, another reason is my family fucking kind of hates me, you know? Not that they dislike me, they're just tired of my shit. <laughs> Especially when I start running my mouth because they know it's either gonna be a smart ass comment, something they didn't know that's gonna make them either look stupid or like amazed that I knew it and they didn't, kind of like, oh, fuck. So the other day, my grandma has been living with my parents for about the last two to three years. She's like 75, 77, I'm not quite sure. There's a certain age that, you know, you just, it doesn't matter. And when I was a kid, she wasn't ready to be a grandmother yet. So, you know, I mean, she was like in her 40s, but she was still going to the bars, hanging out. I would go stay with her, you know, during the summer, but I was like playing Pac-Man and pinball a whole lot. So as she got older, I'm glad that I got a chance to meet her and hang out with her. You know, I, I've met her, I've known her, but I got to know her as I was an adult. So the other day we're sitting there talking and my parents and my grandma live next door to me. So I get to spend a lot of time with, with both of them. And uh, they, uh, we're, we're sitting there watching the news, which I fucking hate doing. And they landed that little car on Mars the other day. And I thought, hey, cool, you know, this will be something I can talk to grandma about. And, you know, grandma is totally against this. And I was like, grandma, what, you know, she was I, I just can't believe they're doing this. I, you know, she's just throwing a fit. I said, but the thing is, you know, that, that car could go there and find things. She goes, well, what the hell is it gonna find? I said, I, I hope it finds life. She goes, oh, whatever. I said, I really do. Now, my grandma has a, uh, a dislike and a fear of cats. I said, I hope it finds a feline species on Mars. <laughs> and she goes, why would you hope that? I go, so it can run the son of a bitch over. <laughs> 
And she goes, really, why is that? I go, then we'll have scientific proof that curiosity killed a cat. <laughs> It's that kind of shit that they don't like. <laughs> and then a lot of people ask me, you know, well, well, why, you know, once they find out, I'm an only child. You know, my parents figured it out early. They had me, they saw what happened, and they went, oh, fuck. We ain't doing this again. And so I'm an only child. So a lot of people say, do, do, you, know, do you miss having brothers and sisters? How the fuck would I know if I miss it? I've never had them. But... I did uh, have something close. That's my cousin Nick. I, I guess I still have him. He's still around. Uh, my cousin Nick came around. I was about six years old. And at first, it was like, eh, whatever, there's a baby around. And his, uh, his mom was a single mother. And back in the 80s, when, uh, when he was born, apparently it wasn't uh, called like a deadbeat dad or whatever. <clears throat> what I remember was called a cocksucker. <laughs> because my dad said that's the cocksucker that knocked your, you know, my sister up and you know, he ran away, he, he just took off. So Nick spent a lot of time with us babysitting. And of course, you know, I was told to stay the fuck away from the baby because, you know, I didn't know. I was six years old. I'd go poke him, he'd cry. I'd stay away from him. He'd be laughing, I'd go over and take whatever he had. You know, I, I was a good older brother, <laughs> apparently, you know. And as he got older, I decided this was going to be uh, an experiment or, you know, just kind of like my playground. Uh, when he got old enough to realize, you know, to interact, I taught him math. If I have three of something and you have one, it's a fair trade. <laughs> Especially when it's like three nickels and one quarter. When you got into paper money, you got more because like five one dollar bills were worth one of those tens. I taught him a lot of math. He still doesn't really realize the difference, I don't think. I taught him well. <laughs> Nick, you know, growing up, we did, you know, everything together. He lived next door to us, too. There was like three or four little trailer houses, houses, whatever, uh, on this lot. And uh, so he lived right next door as well. So I had a lot of access to really fuck with him. And I tortured this poor kid a lot. I was a good older brother. <laughs> and that's what we kind of considered each other, because he was the only child. I was the only child at the young. Yeah. So when Nick got to be, oh, how old was he? We were, we were riding the school bus. So I must have been like in fifth grade. And he, you know, he would have been around kindergarten or so. I used to, uh, he might have been in first grade, so. We'd ride home, we got off the bus at the house there, and I would grab him and beat the shit out of him in front of everybody on the bus as they pulled away. And everybody has their faces glued to the windows watching us. This happened on a regular basis. One day, Nick, you know, he always used to tell me, you just wait till I'm older than you. You'll pay. <laughs> I laughed because I knew it would never happen. One day, he smartened up a little bit. And uh, he had this little, it was like a Nerf T-ball set. The thing is, the bat was padded, but it was fucking hard plastic. And that's the reason that this hand is fucked up and it really hurts when it gets cold outside. We get off the bus and Nick takes off running. And I run after him and all of a sudden he stops, turns around and picks up the bat that he had hidden the night before by the bus stop. <laughs> Took a swing at me, I put my hand up to protect my face, right between my fingers. Everybody on the bus applauded. <laughs> I think at that moment, he knew he was older than me. <laughs> so, you know, things go on and on, and, and uh, you know, as a good older brother, cousin, whatever the hell I was, you know, he had had, uh, he'd had a few uh, brothers and sisters at this point. So now he's the older brother, using me for an example. Which turned into a fucking mess. But he was still a good kid. But we hadn't quite learned how to share yet. We were sitting, my, my grandpa, which I don't talk about my grandpa a lot because uh, a lot of times it just kind of, it's too painful for me. I talked to Nick about him because we were really close. 
But my grandpa had a lot of computer knowledge, way before it was popular. He got me on the, what do they call BBS boards way back when, and you know, he would show me, there wasn't a lot on there, but like text porn and hacking sites and gaming sites, it was, it was all text. But he had all that, he showed it to me when I was way too young to be seeing that shit. And he also would get these computer games for Nick and I. Well, we were playing, you know, he was babysitting Nick, we were playing on the computer, and Grandpa was taking a nap. That's kind of the way he babysat. So we're playing along, and it was my turn, God damn it. <laughs> so we start fighting over the, the controller. Both of us sitting in the same really old, really rickety office chair. The kind that tips back really easy, really fast. Nick was wearing braces at this point, let me add. So the chair tipped back, we start going over, I caught my foot on the desk and shoved Nick out of the chair. <laughs> Nick hits the floor screaming. I'm playing the game going, shut up, you're going to wake Grandpa up. And he's going, Ugh! shut up, you're going to wake Grandpa up. That's when I noticed that Nick's braces have been stuck in the carpet. <laughs> So I paused the game, because I didn't want to lose my place. I was going for a high score, bitches. And I go down there and release him from the carpet. I go, now shut the fuck up. And he's bleeding. That's when I noticed not only did the gums get, or the, uh, the, the braces get stuck in the, in the carpet, but they also got stuck through his lip. Now we have a problem, because I hear Grandpa waking up. I'm like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. Don't tell him what happened. Don't tell him what happened. Grandpa comes in, what the hell happened? I go, well, Nick fell out of this chair, and he goes, God damn it, he grabs his lip and starts pulling on it. Oh. <laughs> and he's going nuts screaming. So then Grandpa does what any good grandfather slash babysitter would do. He grabs a letter opener oh. and goes to work on Nick's lip with no success. So he threw him in the car and took off to go to the emergency dentist, and I played computer all afternoon. It was my turn. <laughs> he passes Nick's mom on the way, and she flags him down, and he says, what happened? He goes, oh, your stupid fucking son fell out of a chair. To the day he died, I never told him the truth. <laughs> kind of feel bad about that, but you know what? I didn't get in trouble. You see, the way Grandpa handled that kind of shit was, and this is another babysitting episode, this was Mick's two little uh, brother and sister. They, and they were just toddlers at the time. Grandpa would babysit them, put them down for a nap, and then put himself down for a nap. The kids would always wake up first. So, you know, sometimes some shit would get broken and whatnot. He'd swat them on the ass. They should know better. Well, this uh, thing started happening around his house. They'd all lay down for a nap. He'd wake up, the kids were awake, and his slippers were in the bathtub. <laughs> so he'd swat them on the ass. Or there was shit in the bathtub. He'd swat them on the ass. When it got serious is when his entire pack of cigarettes got ripped up and thrown on the living room floor. Oh. He beat their asses for that one. Go get himself another pack of cigarettes. The next day, same thing would happen. He'd beat their ass. For like, you know, two or three days straight, this thing happened. One night, he's sitting there watching television at home, and he notices a small, furry animal run across the top of his television. These kids have been getting their asses beat because a baby possum had found its way into his house and had been tearing his shit up, shipping his bathtub, and hiding his slippers. <laughs> You can't really take back an ass beating, so <laughs> I don't even think he said sorry. We just laughed about it, you know, but that's kind of babysitter he was. Well, fast forward a little bit, and what do, you know, I, I'm still kind of this kid, Nick, his older brother in ways. He asked me for advice. He asked me for all kinds of stuff. Thankfully, not money, because I don't fucking have it. But growing up, I would buy him alcohol. I would, you know, give him advice. You know, don't do this shit that got me in trouble. Here's your fall back. I was a really good older brother. I decided that Nick, he was kind of a, a nerd, 
kind of a dork. I didn't want him to go down the same path that I did, so I got him into my Aikido class to teach him a little self-defense and discipline. The way that I found out if he was ready is my dad and I go over to his house. My dad starts a conversation with his mother, which is my dad's sister. I tell Nick, hey, let's go outside for a second and beat the fuck out of him, throwing him in these high break falls where he's flipping through the air, landing on the ground in the dirt. We come back in, Nick is a little bit bloody, not bad, very dirty and dusty, and I said, he's ready, and Dad goes, okay, so we'd like to enroll him in our Aikido class. <laughs> my dad was in on this. He is, to this day, he's my number one student, my number one black belt. The kid's really good. He's better than I ever will be, just because that's how it turns out. The students are always better than the teacher. We just don't tell them that. <laughs> So after I get Nick a little self-confidence, a little you know, self-defense, where he's kind of getting into the popular crowd, I decide it's time to get Nick laid. So I was dating this girl. Uh, we won't discuss her. We'll discuss her during my spotlight show, because it's a, quite a lengthy story. But she had this friend that I couldn't talk into getting in bed with my girlfriend and I. So I'm like, oh, fuck it. I'll just give her to my cousin then, and he can tell me about it. So I hook up this really elaborate scheme and my parents were like all game for it. We we're gonna have this New Year's Eve party. I'm gonna stay at home, hang out with my girlfriend. At the age of 21, me volunteering to stay at home with, on New Year's Eve was like fucking mind blowing for my parents. We're like, cool. I said, well, you know, this girl Renee, her, uh, her friend's gonna come along with us. Okay, and I said, Nick's gonna come over too. Okay. What's gonna happen with Nick and the other girl. I go, well, I don't know. I uh, hope it's something. <laughs> so me and my girlfriend go to bed at like two in the morning. Nick and the other friend go in the other bedroom at like two in the morning. And the next morning, this girl comes walking out and she says, ah, what's up with your cousin? What do you mean what's up with my cousin? You tell me. <laughs> she says, no, are you sure he likes girls? And it was one of those, Oh, fuck, that's something you just don't think about, you know? I'm like, oh, man, but it wouldn't have been cool if he, you know, did like girls. And I said, hey, I got you a date for New Year's Eve. There he is. You know, that would be really <laughs> fucked up. So I'm like, huh, so now I'm trying to think. How do I approach this topic with my cousin? I didn't mean to just inadvertently out him. So I said, hey, Nick, so what happened last night? He goes, I don't know, man. Okay, what do you mean you don't know? He goes, well, we went in there and went to bed. I go, yeah? He goes, well, she kept scooting over, and I thought she was like, needed more room, so I kept scooting over. And then when she finally scooted me to the edge of the bed, I said, oh, I'm sorry, and I laid down on the floor. I go, oh, you're being polite. He goes, yes, I go, you stupid fucking idiot. <laughs> it was time for a talk. Well, Props to him, he actually did wait until he was married, which is something I couldn't do because I've never fucking been married and I don't think I could have waited. Uh, he waited until he got married and apparently successfully he's got like three little girls now, they're cute as shit. And as a dad, he can't pick a favorite, but God damn it, I can because he named one after me. <laughs> it, not Michael, but he did name one of his kids, it's like an, an, uh, an homage to me. I was named and got my grandmother's initials, MJT. Well, Nick, his last name changed when his mom remarried, so I still got the MJ from her, and that's what I call her as MJ. And he said, you know, I'm gonna name her as the homage to you, and fuck, that's my favorite one, I don't give a shit, you know? And she's the cutest one, I can say that he can't. <laughs> And she's the sweetest one, because she always comes up and wants to hug. For some reason, she calls me Uncle Mikey. I'm her fucking cousin, but whatever. However, when he was getting married, he gave me an even bigger honor to name all of his kids after me. He asked me to be his best man. This is either a really good thing or a really bad thing, depending on how much you like to party. <laughs> I've been best man for many weddings, never have been allowed to go to a strip joint. <laughs> I'm not allowed to go to them when I'm not a best man. <laughs> yeah, I get, the training orders only last so long. Well, yeah, that's true, but they keep a picture of your face by the door. So, that's why you buy Dyson's beer, Fred. That's right. <laughs> Master of disguise. 
As long as I don't talk, they don't know who the fuck I am. <laughs> so Nick, Nick decided just to alleviate any confusion, he would get married on his birthday. <laughs> that way he always remembered his anniversary. His wife's anniversary is on New Year's Eve. It makes it, everything easy for the family. It was also his 21st birthday he was getting married on. So the night before, I go over to his apartment when he was still underage. And I said, hey, we're gonna go out and have some drinks. He goes, I can't. I go, at midnight you can. <sighs> okay. <laughs> As we're waiting, I had brought him some alcohol. So we're gonna have a little party before we go and get him completely shit-faced in an hour. Because it was still one o'clock back then. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna ask him, since you know he picked me, gave me the honor of being his best man, do you need any advice or help? Because I'm sure I'm the fucking best person to ask for advice on a fucking marriage. You know, I haven't made a relationship last that long, so hey, ask him, I'll give you good advice, just don't do what I do, do what I say. He says, well yeah, I, I do have some questions for you, and you can probably help me out on this. Shoot. Well, you know that we have both saved ourselves for this evening. I said, okay. He says, we're gonna have some friends come over, decorate the apartment up, and just have some questions. He goes, I, I got a few things that I think would make the evening a little more special. I said, okay. I'm not really knowing if I wanna see these things, but uh, okay. And the first thing he goes and grabs out of the refrigerator is a spray can of whipped cream. I'm thinking, man, this kid for his first time is really gonna shoot for the stars. So I jump in immediately and say, okay, tell your friends to go get a shower curtain. Yeah, you might want to put it on the bed, but I'd rather put it on the floor. And so you, you protect that. Make sure she's not allergic to uh, the whipped cream and all that because, you know, it can cause all kinds of fucked up infections, blah, blah. And I'm going on and on, and he's going, but, 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 I, I, I. And I go into these graphic sexual details about <laughs> what you can do with whipped cream. That's when he pulls a little flat of strawberries on and goes, I was just going to put it on these and feed them to her before we did it. <laughs> and he's fucking mortified by the things that have come out of my mouth, knowing that there's more that he could have heard. <laughs> so he was excited about, you know, the prospect of his first time with his wife and all this. And he had just moved into this apartment. Previous to living in this apartment, he had moved in because he was not getting along with his mother at the time, with his minister. Yeah, for some reason I, I failed in part of it. He's a, he's a good guy, a good family man, has great kids, married, been married for a long time, moved in with his minister, a church-going kid. How the fuck he's influenced by me at all is a, you know, it's a mystery to me as well. Where did you go wrong? Yeah, I know. What the fuck did I do wrong here, you know? Yeah, he had to rebel against me. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a high order right there. So he, uh, you know, he, he moves into this apartment. He's excited about the prospect of having his first time. It's going to be the first time this apartment has ever had any sex in it. <laughs> Let's not forget that he invited me over. <laughs> At midnight, well, before midnight, I took him to the bar across the street. And I didn't feel like walking across the street, and neither one of us were going to drive because I knew what was going to happen. So I called one of my ex-girlfriends. And I said, hey, why don't you come over? You know my cousin. Come on over. Give us a ride across the street. Have a few drinks with us. His birthday's at midnight. She goes, great. She comes over. Then starts talking about her boyfriend all night. So I get on my phone, I call another girl that I was kind of dating at the time. I said, hey, what are you doing? I'm hanging out with some friends. It's my cousin's birthday. He's getting married tomorrow. Why don't you come out? And she shows up. So I go up and uh, order a shot for him. And he goes, oh, um, by the clock over there, it says it's only, I go, fuck them. That clock over there, I told him, you know, at midnight. He says, the clock says midnight, but my watch says it's only a quarter till. I go, fuck them. You got to quit drinking by that time. You, you start drinking by that time. So he does a shot. That prompts my ex-girlfriend to go get him a shot, which prompts the one that I was kind of dating to go get him a shot. So he has three shots in about 15 to 20 minutes. Three different kinds of shots. 
So when the waitress comes over and says, hey, happy birthday, what can I get you? He goes, just give me something I ain't never fucking had before, okay? I said, bring him a gold slugger. He gets the gold slugger, he's going, oh, that's pretty, I go, shut up and drink it. So he drinks that, a beer, and another shot. He's fucking hammered. We get back to his apartment that the girl I was currently kind of dating took us back. And as he's passing out, and I'm explaining to him that you've got to put one foot on the floor to get the room to quit spinning, he has this realization, oh fuck, I was supposed to print my wedding announcements tonight. I said, I gotcha. Just tell me where they're at and what to do. He goes, I'll start them printing. Put, make sure you put the paper in, flower side down. We're good. So as I'm printing his announcements and having copious amounts of nasty sex on his computer on the floor, uh, <laughs> I deflowered his apartment and it was horrible. I mean, just made sure that I wiped my hand off every time I loaded more paper in. Because that would be a horrible thing for somebody to come to the wedding and go, why are your wedding announcements stuck together? <laughs> He got really pissed at me at that point when he found that out because he was supposed to be the first one. At the wedding, I had met the, uh, the minister the night before, before I took him out and got him all fucked up. The minister that he had lived with, I had met him. And the thing about the wedding is we didn't wear shoes. And we were in tuxedos and they were, the girls were in nice gowns and everything, but no shoes because there's some passage in the Bible. I'm not a fan, so I don't know what it is, but something about take your sandals off, you're on holy ground. They wanted that theme for their wedding, whatever. Well, they, uh, the, the, the minister, my cousin, and I walk up this little back stairway right by a door to the outside in the middle of November, like late November, actually. Uh, it's colder than shit. This is a concrete stairway. We're barefoot. I'm standing there like getting frostbite on my toes going, can we fucking go in, please? And... The minister turns to me and he says, now Mike, I know that uh, you played a very big part in raising Nick and influencing him, and I know that you're his sensei, and is there anything that you might have said during your life growing up, or in the dojo, or just anything in general that, uh, that you might want to say at this moment before we walk through this door? And I said, oh, there's a lot of things, but you probably don't want to hear them. And he goes, you know what? He's told me a lot about you. He told me that you're very outspoken. You're very bold. You, you know, you speak what's on your mind. Nothing shocks me. But go ahead <laughs> and say what you have to say to your cousin before you walk through this door. And I go, well, there's a couple things I need to say right now. I said, Nick, don't pass out. He goes, okay. And I go, and don't fuck this up. <laughs> we had to wait for five minutes for the minister to quit laughing his ass off. <laughs> So, you know, that's, uh, I guess, you know, I can close with that, you know, don't fuck it up. So, peace. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's take about 15 minutes, go out, get another drink, do whatever it is you feel like doing, except for Mikey. And... Uh, <laughs> Okay, Mikey, do whatever you feel like doing within the bound of, uh, I don't know, within, within, the, within the law, whatever you can't get caught doing. And we will reconvene in about 15 minutes. We have an uh, a audition for a new samurai, so that'll be our opener. And we will take it from there. Thank you. Yay.